welcome to the uh, uh, this Battle of Ideas session, the status of science after the pandemic. My name is Sandy Starr. I'm Deputy Director of the Progress Educational Trust, a charity that seeks to improve choices for people who are affected by infertility and genetic conditions. And I'm very excited to be chairing this session, uh, which is part of a strand of discussions uh, entitled Battle Over Science uh, that's been taking place in this room throughout the day. Now, you don't need uh, me to tell you that the past couple of years have seen uh, intense debate uh, and discussion about the science and medicine of the uh, COVID virus and, and the global virus pandemic. In fact, never mind the last uh, couple of years, the last couple of hours have seen a heated debate on those, those themes in this room. Uh, so, so some of those issues are still live issues. And if people want to discuss particular controversies during this session, then they can. But, but the main thing that this session is about, at least in the first instance, isn't so much uh, about whether this or that claim or individual uh, or policy is right or wrong. We want to take a step back and think about how we go about deciding uh, that particular claims uh, or individuals or, or policies are right or wrong, how that assessment is made by scientists, uh, how it's made by politicians and policy makers, how it's made by the media, uh, how it's made by the rest of us, and how these different constituencies relate to and negotiate with one another. The consequences of all of this for, the, uh, for public trust in science and scientists, and the converse of that, which is sometimes neglected, which is the trust that scientists have or don't mm. have in the general public. Mm. Now, these questions are hardly new. Uh, they've been discussed in many different contexts, not least at the, at the Battle of Ideas Festival in previous years. But the pandemic uh, has arguably cast these questions in a drastic new light. And perhaps it's put our earlier ideas to the test. And so to get us thinking uh, about all of this, we're fortunate to have a brilliant panel of speakers today uh, whom I'll introduce going from uh, uh, this side to this side uh, in the order in which they're going to speak. So first, we have Dr. Stuart Ritchie, uh, who's a psychologist and lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London. Uh, he writes and broadcasts widely uh, about science. And his latest book, Science Fictions, Exposing Fraud, Bias, and Negligence, and Hype in Science, uh, which is now out in paperback with a new afterword uh, addressing the COVID pandemic. Uh, that This is a sobering, if not devastating, account of the ways that science often fails to live up to its ideals. Uh, but importantly, it also contains recommendations for how that situation might be remedied. After Stuart, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Ganesh Taylor, Ganesh is a research scientist whose work focuses on the networks of genes uh, responsible for forming ovaries and testes during embryonic development. And she's also a prolific public speaker, often to be found uh, discussing her field and its implications at festivals, including this one. Uh, and she shares with me and the charity I work for an interest in genome editing technology in particular, uh, which is currently opening up all sorts of new possibilities mm -hmm. and raising profound questions in science, medicine, and society. Next, we will hear from Dr. Daniel Glazer. Uh, Daniel is a neuroscientist whose academic background spans the sciences and the humanities. Uh, and he's been involved for many years and in many different capacities uh, in science communication and in public engagement with science um, at organizations including the Wellcome Trust. Uh, Daniel is currently director of science engagement at the Royal Institution, which has been a hub for scientific endeavor uh, and discussion since the end of the 18th century. So during those 200 and something years, uh, science has weathered all sorts of global upheavals. Uh, so perhaps the Royal Institution and, and Daniel are well placed to put the recent pandemic or the current pandemic, depending on your point of view, uh, in perspective. And then finally, uh, we have Rob Lyons, who is Science and Technology Director at the Academy of Ideas, the organizers of this festival. Uh, Rob is the convener of the Academy of Ideas Economy Forum. He's written and commented on a wide variety of topics in articles, in reports, uh, in his book, Panic on a Plate, How Society Developed an Eating Disorder. Uh, he's a columnist uh, for Spiked, and he's been chairing various debates during the weekend which relate to this topic of this session in various interesting ways. Um, that's our speakers. You can find out more about their many accomplishments on the Battle of Ideas website. But for now, without further ado, uh, Stuart, can you kick us off, please? Thank you very much. And thanks, Sandy, for the introduction and for plugging my book, which I 
I, I didn't ask you. It was very kind. Was very <laughs> kind of you to do that. Um, uh, thanks very much for coming, everyone. And uh, it's it's great to be it's great to be uh, talking in person uh, after after such a long time of looking at my computer screen. Um, there's a um, down the stairs. There's a stained glass window with um, with uh, sort of doves and sort of crosses and things on it. And it reminded me of the last time I was at an in-person conference, which was in uh, uh, February 2020 um, at the Royal Society, which has its own stained glass window. And that stained glass window says uh, nullius in verba, right, which is the motto of the Royal Society, which is Latin for take nobody's word for it. And we're supposed to, as scientists, have this motto as our, as our kind of guiding principle, take nobody's word for it. Don't just accept on faith um, what, what anyone has said. And of course, this is what is supposed to be instantiated in the peer review system, the, the system of checking each other's claims and, uh, and, and really rigorously testing people's theories and ideas that you get in science. Except, um, as I argue in the book, uh, science has really, uh, in many ways, or at least that system of science, has, has really gone off the rails. And um, uh, there are, you know, although the, the, the principles of science are sound, the way that they're instantiated in peer-reviewed journals and uh, uh, and generally our, our, our scientific discussion um, has really gone very wrong. And I think the incentives for scientists push them in the wrong direction, away from uh, the truth-seeking exercise that science should be and towards, uh, well, fraud, bias, negligence, and hype, as I have in the subtitle of the book. So uh, uh, the, the very constant pressure to publish papers, for instance, is, a, is, a, is something I felt myself personally and um, uh, you know, working scientists uh, uh, you know, on, the, on the panel, I'm sure we, you know, um, we, we, we can discuss this. But I think the pandemic has accelerated these bad incentives. You've seen examples of scientists um, uh, just pushing out uh, papers because they feel like they want to help. You've seen scientists pushing out low quality research because they uh, they think that they that their own field has something to contribute. So from very low level stuff like the people who did a scientific investigation of whether the length between your index finger and your uh, ring finger is related to COVID risk, um, just because they were doing that for something else and they thought, well, let's do it for for COVID. To high level stuff where um, people are wasting resources by doing endless low quality small scale trials of drugs like hydroxychloroquine or uh, vitamin D, uh, which isn't a, a drug, but you know what I mean, um, uh, uh, um, I, I, and just to see, their, to see their effects. And we end up with this morass of evidence uh, uh, that was often of very low quality that people can't trust. And what I talk about in the book is that, uh, and which was written largely you know, before COVID, is that this is having a really, a really uh, bad effect on whether scientists can trust each other um, uh, and whether scientists can trust uh, and whether the public can trust the, the the research that they put out there and that they have often funded. So, you know, there's been many examples during the COVID pandemic, but uh, one that, that I write about in the afterword of the book is the, the hydroxychloroquine scandal. Not the people who were pushing hydroxychloroquine. You know, Donald Trump was a fan of it and it became a kind of a, a, a thing on the political right to be a fan of hydroxychloroquine. But then you had people from... Harvard University publishing papers in the top medical journals in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet, which uh, uh, turned out to be based on, I think it hasn't been fully proven yet, but, but I, th I, th I think it's fairly fair to say that they were incorrect, if not fraudulent data, that they simply hadn't checked. Uh, uh, the pressure to publish something related to hydroxychloroquine was so strong that they, they simply did not check whether the data were, 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 uh, were correct or even made even a vague amount of sense and published these papers in the top medical journals. They had to be retracted within two weeks of publication. That was in the summer of last year. We're now seeing uh, a, a story where um, uh, this, this new drug, uh, ivermectin, uh, again, we're finding clear examples of scientific fraud um, in some of the papers that have been, that have been published on that. And, and again, there's a very large, uh, very strong movement of people online who are, who are very pro this. And so I think um, uh, to go back to that stained glass window about take nobody's word for it, we've got to the point where uh, uh, you can, whether you're in the media or whether you're just in, in the general public reading stuff, you see something that's in a, a peer reviewed paper and you think, well, that's been checked. It's been tested. It must have been through the rigorous process of peer review. But I think if anything we've learned over the past year is that that peer review process is, is uh, perhaps better than nothing, but it's not uh, 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 actually a, a, as rigorous as we would 
as we would like to think. So um, I really, uh, um, you know, the, the, the principle of all science and the principle that we should think about when we're, 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 we're talking about science really should be that nullius and verba, take nobody's word for it. And I'd be interested to hear um, uh, what other people think, um, you and the rest of the panel think, about the extent to which we should, we should trust scientists or the extent to which we should always be rigorously uh, uh, and, and kind of um, disinterestedly skeptical of every single finding. So that's, that's my uh, opening. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm thoroughly depressed now. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, wow. I almost feel shy now of admitting to the fact that I'm a scientist following that kind of statement. Um, <laughs> no, so, um, yes, yeah, so as Sandy said, I, I'm, I'm a scientist. I work in a research lab. And so um, I can fully second uh, what Stuart was just saying about the peer, the pressure, excuse me, to publish, the pressure to publish and whatnot. But when, when I got asked about this question, I, I sat down and wrote myself out some little thoughts that I had, and I thought I'd share them today with you in this order. So the question was about the, the status of science po post-pandemic, essentially, right? So Stuart was talking about a very particular definition of science I would put forward to you. Science is, science is a word that is used to describe many different things, right? Science is the institution, the academic institution of science, which is what Stuart was talking about. But of course, science is also the scientific method, right? That's another valid interpretation of that word. And the method itself is, is the, the tool of interest. And when I talk about science, I mean that specifically. That, that scientific method of interrogating the world, gathering data, forming hypotheses, testing whether or not your data is in keeping with that, and in thus doing, able to sort of paint a more accurate picture of reality, hopefully. Right, But in that sort of process of using the scientific method does come the institution that uses that because of the sort of st structures that we have within society for how we fund things like this effectively. And that thus is, thus is the root of academic science essentially, right? But then within that uh, comes this idea of status, which is already alluded to in the question, right? Is there status immediately associated with this institution of science? Is it just status of the institution? Is it status of the people who make up the institution? And so that brings me to the, the other point, which has been raised to some extent, which is scientists as individuals, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am a scientist, as I said in my opening. That means I've studied some stuff for some years. I'm supposedly trained uh, and supposedly qualified to be able to engage this pr process of science, the scientific method, with some um, expertise, supposedly. But, and I think that this pandemic has really highlighted that. I studied the specific activity of a specific set of genes in a specific set of cells that do something really interesting during a specific point of embryonic development, right? Now, I probably am more familiar with the scientific method than the average person on account of that, but that does not particularly place me particularly well for commenting on viruses, for example, or even, you know, pandemics, or even making a policy suggestion or a, a, a judgment of what should happen there. And so that brings me to the one thing that I will say, and this is what I hold to be true as a scientist and as a person, which is science is the business of observing the world. An observation is all very good and well, but it's not a judgment, that's a separate thing. And that is, we have different societal mechanisms for doing that. And so that is really the problem that we have now. Whose job is it to make the judgments based on the scientific uncertainties that we can observe and, and make? And, and how do we make sense of this? And whose job is it? Um, and I'll leave you with this last thought, which is, you know, quite timely in my case, I think. In the last 10 years in particular, um, the, the sort of onus of communicating science and the findings of science has increasingly been shifted onto the shoulders of the scientists who are doing the research, right? We call it public engagement. Some might say that that's what I'm doing right now, supposedly, right? But is it the job of the people who do the academic research to communicate this stuff or not? And what we saw, I think, a lot in the pandemic was suddenly this head-snapping reaction where everyone turned around and went, where are the bloody scientists, right? Where are they? Why aren't they the ones telling me I want to hear it out of their mouths? 
And the point about the pandemic and about a lot of the things that we care about in society is it's not a matter of scientific fact that we're talking about. There is a, you know, there is some science and scientific fact that can be spoken about. But what do you do in the face of a pandemic is not a scientific question. And so why were we looking to scientists? Daniel. Thank you, Sandy. Lovely to be here, everyone. Hello. Um, so, yeah, the, the, old, the old joke about how do you get an elephant's attention, um, and the answer is you kick it really hard in the shin, uh, but you have to be sure that you want its full attention. <laughs> and that's kind of, as somebody who's been keen on more science in public life, how it's felt a little bit uh, over the last um, uh, few months. I remember you wanted a bit of historical perspective. I remember being uh, in San Diego quite a few years ago. Who knows? Radio Lab, the program online, yeah. Um, so the, one of the presenters is a guy called Robert Krolwich, and he, his day job was he was the political correspondent at ABC, in the network in the States, and his sort of hobby was, uh, was doing uh, Radio Lab and a program I was in then called Nova. And uh, it was the time of the election where George W. Bush had taken a position on stem cells, right, and mm -hmm. research on stem cells. And we were lamenting it, chatting on the way to filming a, a thing about mirror neurons, which is something I do know about. And I was saying how rubbish it was that Bush was taking this position and how shocking. And Kralwich said something very interesting. He said, Dan, you believe that people should be more engaged with science, right? It should be part of everyday life. It shouldn't just be left to the scientists. And I was like, yeah. He said, well, then you don't get to complain if the people who get interested in it don't agree with you or you don't agree with them, right? The fact that there is a scientific question as a, as a talking point on the hustings for the presidential election in the state, you should welcome, even if you lament the position that the candidate is taking. And I think that's something which scientists need to uh, take for real in this context. Public understanding of science doesn't equal public acceptance of science, first of all. Just because you understand it doesn't mean you agree with it. And secondly, it doesn't mean that you agree with the position of the individual scientist. Now, it does seem to me that there's a bunch of paradoxes built into the kinds of pressure uh, on science and on scientists that this pandemic has brought, which are instructive here. And the first thing, and I think I guess you did allude to this, Stuart. It's, it's kind of accelerated a bunch of things that were true anyway. So I think there's research to show that nature papers, so those of you that don't know about scientific publishing, nature is kind of the highest profile scientific journal, and a nature paper is, is a currency with, 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 with which labs trade their reputations. A nature paper is like a very big deal science. The more impactful the story, like a nature cover, right? the more impactful the story, the higher profile the journal it's published in, the more likely it is to turn out to be false. So there's a positive correlation between impact factor and lack of reproducibility. Stuart, it's more your area than mine, but I believe it's right. So the pressure to be relevant uh, encourages forces, offers an opportunity for scientists to step back from the kinds of self-checking that they would normally be doing. And that perverse incentive, I think, is even more true in times of crisis, and we should be aware of it. You know the John Durant thing about there are three things the public need to know about science. There's scientific facts, there's how science works, and there's how science really works. So scientific facts is like, you know, that a virus uh, uh, can't be killed by an antibacterial soap, stuff like that. How science works is like about falsification and truth and statistics and all that stuff. And how science really works is how do you get funded, yeah. right? And the, uh, the bit about public engagement which deals with how science really works is particularly important, as we would hope, in the preparation for pandemics, mm -hmm. but also when, when it becomes super relevant, we need to educate people in that. There's a couple more perversions, or, or let's say infelicities, in the way that these things are structured, which I think are really worth bearing in mind. And the first is a theory which, sadly, I rather fear I may have described already on a panel years ago with you, but you know, kick me under the table if I have. But it's what I call the, the, the lab next door theory. And, and Gunessa alluded to this in her remarks. If you go to a lab and you say, excuse me, what are they doing in the lab next door? And they say, well, they're taking mice and they're taking people with diseases and they're taking genes from the people and putting them in the mice and they're seeing if the mice get the diseases. Right? Because, okay, I get that. You go to that lab and you say, what do you do? And they say, well, we've got a reverse hybridization model of the transcription <laughs> factors of the DNA dehydrogenase, and Fiona's laughing in the background. And, and, and it's reciprocal, right? which is to say that the best people to explain science are the people in the lab next door to the science, not in the lab itself. Okay? And so for the reasons of the perversions of the incentives to publish, and for this weird uh, non-linear effect of closeness, right, it gets worse before it gets better, yeah? uh, 
we should not be listening to the people who are doing the work directly in trying to judge the results that are most relevant to the crises that we face, in my view. There's all kinds of history of science or theory, uh, history of philosophy of science stuff that we should be aware of, in particular that what we ought to be doing is trying to falsify our theories, not prove them. And again, in a time of pandemic, that's uh, 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 more or less out the window, um, and we have to be aware of that. And the final piece I would say, and I speak now as a research scientist with children, uh, I think I can say, is it, is it being, it's not being recorded, is it? So um, I, I remember being called when my kids were young by uh, Camden uh, Public Health, you know, the local health authority. Oh, it is being recorded. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they wanted my uh, daughters to get a TB vaccine, right? And that and TB vaccination, if you know, is decided on a kind of borough by borough basis. And uh, the, the rates of TBX, this uh, antibiotic resistant um, uh, uh, TB, uh, were really high in Camden, which is the borough that I live in. But I was almost sure that the North Camden bit, which I live in, uh, with its nice cafes and, and leafy uh, 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 paths and, and, the ha and Hampstead Heath nearby, was not the place they meant when they talked about that. It was grotty South Camden, Somers Town, and all those areas which were driving the need to vaccinate. And so I ignored the advice and didn't bring my daughter along, right? I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I made a decision to go against public advice on vaccination because I felt I was smart enough to do it. And it left me, sadly, with the following thought, um, uh, that perhaps individual decisions about vaccination, you know, whether you should follow government advice or not, are okay if you're smart, if you're a scientist, but those who don't have the training shouldn't be allowed uh, to make those kinds of choices. Now, I'm not advocating for that position, clearly. But it did give me pause because it, I realised that my own responses to situations which I was faced with were not in concert with the values that I espoused. And noticing my own hypocrisy has undermined my own confidence in my ability as a scientist to speak rationally because I observed early on that I don't act that way. And I dare say, you know, those of you who know me might be surprised, but I felt a degree of humility from that. I don't really understand this stuff. If I want to know things I, I talk to people who do even though I'm a scientist I don't think my views on this are any better than anyone else's and on with that position and then looking up things on the science media center's rapid reaction force I felt that I was putting myself in the best position but not because of my knowledge as a scientist but because of my approach towards humility Thank you. finally Rob uh, thank you um, I'm sorry I'm reading this off a phone. Um, I, I only finished my notes on Friday night and didn't have access to a, a printer over the weekend. A, a crisis of reproduction, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I, mean, I want to stay, take a step back as the sort of part-time science journalist here and say that I think science has had a pretty good pandemic, actually. Um, but I think it's illustrated a really important tension. I'm, sort of sl I'm slightly echoing points that other people have made here. Um, I think science amongst the general public has got a great deal of authority because it does help us to understand the world and it generally seems to make the world a better place. Um, and you know, we could do with more of more science properly done, um, th that would be a good thing. However, the assertion of authority is anathema to science. As, as Stuart said right at the start, you know, nullius in verba, don't take anybody's word for it. Um, and I think that that sort of tension is kind of uh, bound up with the, the, the problems of science's status today. Um, so just to be a, a little bit of a cheerleader for a moment, uh, I think the, the, the pandemic has brought home how important science really is. I mean, two centuries ago, if this virus had hit, we'd just like lose 2% or 3% of the population. And we'd go, that was bad. And we'd all... And it would, it would only stop when we get to herd immunity. And that would, be, you know, we wouldn't probably wouldn't even understand what had been going on. I mean, even as, you know, John Snow was doing his work on cholera in the 1840s, I mean, like his suggestion that like, there might be a poison or you know, basically a germ in the water that was causing the problem, really controversial, bit of a nutter, really. What's he on about? Mm -hmm. uh, researchers doing Spanish flu in the, uh, 100 years ago were, were looking for a bacteria and nobody had even seen a virus until about 90 years ago, I believe. Um, and now this time round, we recognized it was a new disease pretty quickly. We'd sequenced the genome, which is something we couldn't do sort of 15 or 20 years ago, by the 11th of January 2020. We had plausible vaccine candidates pretty soon afterwards, and then we were able to ramp up the trialing and production of them to the point where 10 months after the first vaccine went into somebody's arm, we've dished out six and a half billion doses of them. I mean, we should be like, wow. And there's all the stuff we're blasé about, you know, accurate testing, 
genomic testing so we can mm -hmm. see when we've got new variants coming along, rapid research on drugs that already exist to see if they can be repurposed for for this uh, disease and the announcement last week about monopiravir, this new Merck drug that uh, seems to have a really, uh, on the initial findings anyway, seems to have a really big impact on hospitalizations. And I think we should say, yay, science. Um, and the, But as Stuart has said, you know, we've been set off on a lot of wild goose chases and blind alleys um, by poor, small research or you know, badly interpreted research, even fraud. Um, so there's, a, and I think there's also some things that still need to be resolved in this that we haven't we haven't really come, come to a firm answer on. How effective are masks and mask mandates in preventing the disease? There's, that seems to be hugely controversial still. I think masks do have uh, a, a role to play, but you know whether we should be sending the police around to arrest people who don't wear them in public, for example, I think is going far too far. How much we should rely on computer models for example, and really understand the assumptions uh, behind them and why the, so that we can understand why they're wildly off the mark sometimes or even where the virus even came from. So science done well can be completely amazing. Science done badly can lead us badly astray. Um, and I get wor worried about this question of authority about when science is used for instrumental or political ends or the way that the, si the authority gets used. So Stuart wrote a really good article uh, on for Unheard this week about um, the fact that you've got these, you know, you've got Nobel Prize winners in one field trying to comment on the pandemic in some completely different field and spouting absolute nonsense about it. Um, and you know, this, this kind of credentialism, I've won a Nobel Prize or I'm the professor or something or other at some top university and therefore I should, I have authority on this subject and a lot of the time those people are wrong. Um, and we have to find a way of Skip being skeptical and asking the right kind of questions about these things, but even in the public uh, sector, I think that, that w there are things that we should worry about. So we've seen Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance on the news an awful lot over the past sort of eighteen months, and I think Chris Whitty is a it looks like he's an excellent doctor and a very well-meaning, uh, humane sort of guy. But do I should I take him so seriously when he's talking about obesity and banning junk food advertising? I think that, that that could be an inappropriate use of authority. Or Patrick Valance demanding emissions cuts to tackle climate change. You know, uh, is that repurposing some of that authority from the pandemic in a, w in a way that actually is just inappropriate? And there's this long-standing question as well of you know, we want evidence-based policy, of course we do, but that how that can get turned into policy-based evidence by politicians or commentators or campaigners or even scientists themselves cherry picking evidence or looking for evidence to justify a predetermined sort of policy that they they want to espouse. Um, so that that is a problem of, of, of authority. And yet, few of us have the expertise. I mean, I, I doubt there's anybody who has a grasp of the science in all its different uh, sort of facets, and the technology and the uh, policy options to really sort of give us a clear idea of what we should do. Um, Ultimately, but ultimately, we do need to rely on authoritative figures because we are not going to be able to sort of get our gra handle on all of these things. And then there's another factor which is new, I think, um, which is tribalism. So there's this kind of thing, well, I'm pro-lockdown or you're anti-lockdown, and we kind of end up cheerleading for our side, even if some of the people on our side are talking nonsense. Um, you know, it ends up in a, a sort of very awkward place, I think. Um, so there are a lot of issues to deal with that. So, and I think the only way that we can really deal with that tension, uh, and it's not a perfect solution, but it's the only way forward, I think, mm -hmm. is with honest, critical debate and sceptical debate. Um, so hopefully we'll get a good burst of that just now. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. So four different perspectives there. Uh, Three people with doctor in front of their name rather being humble and hiding their light under a bushel. <laughs> uh, uh, the journalist and the sort of research and patient advocate putting a slightly, slightly more on the front foot for science. Um, interesting questions about authority, the meaning of scientific authority and what is and isn't authoritative. And who gets to speak on what and, and wearing what hat. You know, someone with a, with a Nobel, uh, they may be misusing their 
uh, uh, authority or their credentials when they remark on something, but, but surely they should be entitled to remark on certain things in the public domain, as should we all. And uh, Ganesh's views on uh, the science and politics of the pandemic are, are ones I take quite seriously, even if they weren't the subject of your, your research. So a lot of interesting questions there. And although I, I would deeply love to, to dig deeper, I'm actually going to give you guys first dibs and go out to the floor. And I'm going to ask people to put their hands up. There's two roving mics. Thank you. Can I come to the middle here, please? Uh, so one question and I suppose uh, a comment as well uh, that I'd love to hear the panel's kind of views on. So I, I work for a news organization. Um, and the news organization I work for, I was lucky enough in, you know, within the company, we had a very experienced team kind of reporting on this. We had a brilliant health editor who's very experienced, uh, who's since retired along with seemingly half of the health editors in the country, which says <laughs> something about their workload <laughs> last year. Um, but we also had a science team, all of whom had been sort of, you know, trained as scientists, all very experienced. and. I suppose one of the things that kind of uh, made me slightly nervous uh, during the pandemic, especially the throes of the first lockdown, is because it was such big news. You had a lot of science stories coming out from, you know, non-scientifically trained journalists, and even the stories that came out from the, you know, the scientifically trained journalists, you know, would say something like, you know, not this hasn't been peer reviewed, which I think to the ma large majority of the public public means absolutely nothing, and so. There was so much of this coming out, it was very confusing. And so I, I, I wondered what the kind of the role of the journalists within this is, because obviously, you know, nature want to print big papers with big impact uh, factors. But part of that is so that they can get in the newspapers and obviously news editors are kind of commissioning lots and lots. And so it felt very confusing from the sort of public's point of view. That's the kind of question, I suppose. The point um, sort of comes back to what you were saying, Rob, about the vaccines. And I've got a couple of friends who are kind of vaccine hesitant. And um, w a lot of them, their main reason for being slightly hesitant is because it happened too quickly. And as someone who kind of, you know, used to do science and learned about the kind of how, how drugs are developed and stuff, I just find it absolutely astounding that the science almost did so well that people were like, oh, no, I don't want that. So it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. And that's, I suppose, more of a comment than a question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I saw a, um, uh, uh, a presentation by um, Dr. Richard Lindzen, who's a, an astrophysicist from uh, MIT, um, a few years ago at the Royal Mechanical Institute. And he uh, said that, uh, in the relation to climate change, he said that um, CO2 is a marginal gas and effectively doesn't really affect the climate. Now, I've not heard that anywhere else. Uh, that's a quite a controversial opinion to take. But my question is less around the sort of the issue of, of, of climate science, but more somebody who um, uh, doesn't understand and is very unlikely to actually understand really what's going up there and how it all works and all the variables and all the rest of it, like probably everybody in this room and you know, probably nearly everybody in society. And yet, and yet uh, scientific papers around that issue are, are entirely reorganizing society. So. So my, my, my question is, really, and, and so what people tend to do is go to who they trust and go to the mm -hmm. curators and people they trust or their instincts might be a bit, um, you know, actually I'm sort of pro-freedom on this or I, I, you know, I think there's a sort of anti-human feeling to this or, or, or what have you. So you tend to sort of fall back on your preconceived, you know, thoughts, prejudices, political views and what have you. So my, my real question is how, how do you, how, how, you know, how do we make sense of things that are intensely complicated that we can't understand that have a... Uh, you know, a big impact on, on policy. Great. And, and can we have a question at the front, comment at the front here as well, please? Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Bedell from the University of Manchester. Um, just a couple of quick questions for the, the panel that you might want to um, expand on. First one, um, I've got a, a, an impression that the tribalism that Rob mentioned is particularly bad in the United States compared to here. Um, I just wanted to know the opinions on whether you thought that was true or not. Um, and secondly, if if that is the case, is that something which is inevitably going to end up coming to the United Kingdom, or is there a way that we can avoid that sort of tribalism? Because I think that's, if it is true, that's something that's particularly damaging that we should be trying to avoid. That was it, right? Thank you. So I will come back, come out to you again in a moment, but I'll, I'll allow the speakers to pick up on anything they like from what's just been said, or respond to one another. Um, but I'll recapitulate. Um, we, well, we had a question: What's the role of the journalist in a pandemic such as this? Um, and, and the interesting example of the, the vaccine-hesitant people who, uh, who think the vaccine was developed too quickly. 
Uh, Rob, you were chairing a session earlier with our Greek friend, whose surname you can pronounce and I can't, um, who's a very good speaker, and he was of the opinion that the vaccine was developed far too slowly. <laughs> he thought it should have happened months earlier and to hell with all the, you know, bureaucracy and, and procedures. Um, so, so that's, that's, goodness knows what the vaccine hesitant people would have thought if that had been the case. Um, we had a question with the, the example of, you know, the, an astrophysicist with a, with a potentially a maverick view on the role of uh, carbon dioxide in, in climate, climate change. You know, whom do you trust? Do you take them seriously? How do you weigh it up? Uh, who, are the, who curates all of this? Um, um, how, are, how are we lay people to make sense of it all? Uh, and then a question about uh, tribalism, whether it's, worth, whether it's worse in the USA. And I'm thinking, it, does, do the national boundaries actually matter in an age of social media where an awful lot of, of tribalism plays out? Um, who would like to kick us off? Ganesh? Yeah, actually, can I, sorry, can, I'm gonna take this liberty. Can you raise your hand if you've heard of PCR? Does PCR mean anything to you? All right. Uh, could you raise your hand if you think you could explain how a PCR works? Amazing. That's really interesting. I was thinking about that as you were talking, Rob, right? Because on one hand, you raise this really like positive note about how suddenly, you know, people clearly, very clearly, evidently in this room have started hearing more very technical terms, actually, right? PCR is super technical. But then with that comes this bizarre illusion of like, okay, well, now I, I know of it. Is that enough for me to know how to make a decision based on it? Um, and it made me then immediately think of something that Stuart said, which was to do with, you know, actually to do with how publishing works in academia and the speed of it and, and the pressure to publish and all that. And you might be a little bit depressed to hear this, but throughout the pandemic, my science Twitter feed has become filled with all these um, funny memes, basically, from scientists going, guys, I managed to publish a paper and it didn't even say COVID in the title. <laughs> or like, guys, you want to get a paper out? Just whack it COVID into the title. You'll be sorted. Hey. Yeah. And, you know, on one hand, you know, that that's like funny because, you know, that is actually what it's like. And that's one way of processing that terrible situation that we're in. But on the other hand, it's quite a concerning thing to note. And I guess it brings me to the point that sort of keeps shining through this entire debate, I think, which is how, how, how are we meant to make sense of a growing body of human knowledge where the rate of expansion is well beyond what the average person can keep on top of, well beyond what even an expert is able to keep on top of. Go Do you on, mean, Sandy. Ganesh, the rate of expansion of the knowledge or the rate of expansion of the papers? Because one theme of exactly. this book is that the two things are slightly different. Exactly. No, there is a difference. There is a difference in the rate, right? Though knowledge has expanded already quite well beyond the reach of which most people can keep on top of expertise in multiple fields. And, you know, we talk about this sort of, not intersectional, what is it? What's the phrase that's thrown around a lot that we need more... Um, interdisciplinary thank you yeah. that word interdisciplinary science and we need more of that because now the the sort of space between you know zones of expertise is growing it becomes really difficult to sort of integrate those things and so the how do you do that how do you integrate both <coughs> multiple areas of expertise the sheer volume and rate of or perceived rate of it and, and the, the value of trusted figures in that integration is key to this debate. And I'd love to say I know the answer to that, but I'm afraid, I don't think I do, beyond having good old fashioned conversations, more and more of them. Um, I, yeah, that's, that's what do I Do you know thinking. the answer, Stuart? I wish I did because, well, I, I, I actually think I might write the next book on it. Exactly what you were talking about, which was, which was how do you make sense of, you know, uh, uh, controversial topics. like like. We all think Jupiter exists, right? But you couldn't, you couldn't like necessarily tell me all. You couldn't, you yeah. couldn't explain all the, the. It's exactly the same as the PCR thing you yeah. mentioned. You couldn't explain all the, you know, uh, how the how the telescopes work and every single a a physical aspect of how we work out specifically that that light in the sky is Jupiter. Like, or maybe if someone's a physicist in the room, they could. But that's but that's the point. Most of us, most of us, most of us can't. Um, uh, uh, and then you know, add add that to the. The, uh, uh, the fact that scientists can often go completely off the rails. I mean, you mentioned the, the, this one lone guy who's saying that CO2 is not a, a, an important gas, but you know, the inventor of the PCR test, Kerry Mullis, who won a Nobel Prize, spent the last part of his life uh, saying that HIV doesn't cause AIDS and uh, was, a, was, a, was a huge uh, um, proponent of you know, AIDS denialism, I guess he you would call really it. He was really high for most of that and time. And he though, took, a lot of psychedelic, <laughs> took a lot of psychedelic drugs uh, as well, yes, yes, which is not necessarily something to, something to criticize him for, but certainly the AIDS thing was. And, um, and uh, uh, you know, so I, uh, 
the, the scientist who you would hope to be the kind of contrarian authority figure, uh, the contrarian, you know, anti-authoritarian, uh, anti-authority figures can often be themselves oh, totally off the rails. So um, we need a better system of being able to see which research is high quality and which isn't, right? And at the moment, we've got the system where most of it is done behind closed doors, right? Scientists do their do their research. They don't share their data with the world. They don't share their methods with the world. Often, often people can, you know, uh, the, the whole point of writing a scientific paper is that someone else can come along and do the same experiment and get the same results, right? But, but in in in, in almost every single case, that's that's not possible. Um, there was a cancer research reproducibility project that happened a few years ago where they selected fifty papers from the cancer research literature to try and replicate, so other under independent labs could could try and find the same results and in not a single case could they even start to do the experiment because there wasn't enough information in the papers that people published and i think they're down to you know they cut it from 50 to i don't know 18 or something and they're able to you know try some replications uh, uh, now and i think it's been a mixed bag some of the the <coughs> results have replicated and some haven't but that tells me that, that there's a real serious problem in, in in these in these scientific publications, which are supposed to be the currency of science and all that. And you you know you mentioned the whole idea of a nature publication being the being the most exciting thing you can get as a scientist. But what's the point of them if if you can't actually come along and, and, and evaluate them? So we need to uh, change the way that we publish research. And there's lots of different ideas for this. Some of which are talk about the book, but you know some of which are have come about in the last you know the last year or so about how we, we, we change the way that, that scientists publish. So it's not a matter of doing all, everything behind closed doors and then sending it to a, a journal, a scientific journal, and saying, you know, take my word for it that I did it this way and then tell me whether you think it's good or not. Um, it becomes much more of a kind of a, a, a process where you say, well, I've got an idea for a, 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 a scientific study. Let's, let's agree that, that, it, that it's actually going to be good and it's going to answer the questions that we want it to answer. Um, and then you go off and do it, and the journal agrees to publish it, whether or not it comes out with the result they want, the result they don't want, uh, something that's uninterpretable or ambiguous. Um, uh, I think that is the way we should be changing uh, uh, towards to, 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 to do research instead of, again, this whole, just take my word for it, uh, um, this thing that's behind closed doors. So this is this whole idea of open science that people talk about, that putting data online, putting methods online to allow you know, people who are interested to, to, to go in, because if you have nothing to hide, uh, why hide it? And I'll, I'll bring you in, uh, Daniel and Rob, but just to ask a question as well. If Yes, we have these uh, uh, credentialed scientists or Nobel winning scientists who, who go off the rails or, or whom nobody takes seriously. Um, but is there is there a place for the converse? Because, OK, we may not have a, a Renaissance man like a da Vinci or a man who knows the whole of natural history like Darwin. Um, but someone who aspires to know a lot of things and talk to the public about them, is that person inevitably a dilettante or talking through their hat? Uh, or is there a role for such such public figures? It's easy for those of us in science communication to get cynical, but... Um, um, well, there was someone did a study, I think, an investigation. When was the last... I, 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 it is a bit gendered, isn't it? But when was the last man alive who knew everything, right? When was the last man alive who knew everything? And they thought it was probably about 1720. Oh, you, could have, you could have kind of <laughs> known everything then. And then from that point, it all became a little bit more complicated. <laughs> and from that point, there was no one... It was, it was impossible to imagine a person who actually knew everything. I think at that time included literature. And I think that there's a really important point here, which speaks to me about engagement, which is that, and I think you said this a little bit, Rob, nowadays in science, and particularly with interdisciplinary science, um, uh, it's impossible for a big relevant study, I know this from, let's say, Sanger Institute that was doing uh, research into artemisinin-resistant uh, uh, malaria in, in uh, the Thai... Burma border with some Karen refugees. You know, they said, if we're going to do the ethics of this properly, like properly so that everyone can understand it, there's one thing I can tell you for sure. It will have broken out by the time we get the ethics through. So we have to react fast. But to do that study, you needed epidemiologists, informaticians, geneticists, uh, you needed <laughs> pediatricians. Uh, and there is no single scientific discipline that could understand all the bits of science that were necessary to do the study. So in that case, what you need is engagement. And this is the converse of the lab next door theory. <coughs> Public engagement or engagement starts at the door of your lab. Because yeah. if you're going to collaborate with other scientists, yeah. you need to be able to explain what you do outside the coterie yeah. language of your own discipline. And the ability and the requirement to do that yeah. is driven by the need for interdisciplinary research, but will set us in very good stead uh, when we try to engage with the public. Now, you asked for a historical view. I just want to make two quick points. Jupiter. So 
Um, you know that bloke, uh, the Galileo thing, Copernicus, and the whole Earth going around the sun, sign going around the Earth. So the evidence was against Galileo, Copernicus at the time. How long did it take before the last discrepant observation, right, which, which apparently suggested that the sun goes around the Earth rather than the Earth going around the sun, how long after Galileo did it take before the last discrepant observation was explained? And the answer is it's about 150 years. There was a thing called stellar parallax. If we're whizzing around the sun, stars that are far away ought to move relative to each other, but they don't. Well, it could be that they're very, very far away, yes. but they have an apparent diameter. So if they're far enough away, you can do the trig for them not to move relative to each other. They must be absolutely huge. <laughs> they have to be enormous. And that's unbelievable. It took 150 years before people understood enough atmospheric physics to work out that the reason why the stars had an apparent diameter was because of the way that light behaved uh, through water vapor in the atmosphere. Okay, So if you wait for all the discrepant observations to be explained till everything is nice and consistent, you're going to be well behind the curve. But equally, we can't have a scientific revolution every 10 years. So I think that, you know, we have to be a little bit careful about our quest and our demand for evidence, in my view. Uh, we have to understand better how science works. And very finally, our Christmas lectures at the RI this year are with Van Tam on the COVID piece. And I'm arguing, I might not win, but, but that's, it's not my job to win, that we should have a Gantt chart uh, in, in the lecture just to explain how we got the 10-year process down to one year. And the answer is we overlapped a bunch of things which normally you wait till they've completed. And the reason we did that was people were prepared to take some really big financial risks. And the Australian model, as you know, where they got this vaccine and it worked except it made everyone look like they have HIV and was then abandoned. They It worked fine for COVID. It just spoofed the HIV test. It didn't give anyone HIV. They abandoned it. They'd already built the production line to manufacture it by the time they realized. And that was a huge sunk cost of billions. People were prepared to take that risk, which is one of the reasons why it compressed. You just need to explain a Gantt chart, you know, tell, opportunity to explain things. Define a Gantt chart. Um, it's a, a chart which people who organize stuff, not like me, use, uh, where you've got to work out, you've got to finish laying the foundations before you can start building the walls, before you can start putting the roof on. If you can find a way of overlapping those things, you can finish the house much quicker. May not be as stable though, Sandy. <laughs> you put them in scientific grant applications and then never follow them. Oh yeah, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah. I'm reminded that in the very first Sherlock Holmes story, uh, Watson is incredulous that Holmes neither knows nor cares that the sun goes around the Earth. Sorry, <laughs> that the Earth goes around the sun rather than the other way around, uh, because he says it's not relevant to what he's doing and, and his brilliance, and, and indeed it isn't, <laughs> which is interesting. Rob, what do you think? Um, well, on uh, yes, on, on on doing. I mean, Stuart in the uh, early on in his book has a, a bit about Robert Boyle, mm. uh, and uh, like really, really explaining how he came to his conclusions and like going actually going around the country and showing people said like you'd put this in a, and so it's 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 the corollary of nullius in verba, which is don't take anyone's word for it. Should should be I don't know what the Latin is, but for scientific papers should be don't take my word for it. Here is everything you need to know in order to reproduce this uh, thing, and then you can we can argue about the interpretation of what the results mean. Um, in terms of the 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 role of science journal, I mean science journalists. I mean I'm not really a science journalist. I'm a kind of political commentator who writes about sciencey things, really. Um, so I'm science journalist adjacent, <laughs> as it were. Um, but yeah, I mean, science journalis journalism is really, really important. And actually, there wasn't enough of that in, for example, the press conferences when the hard hitting questions have been asked by Robert Peston, who's an idiot when it comes to science, for example. Um, that's a really big that 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 short changes the public because it's not really holding a politicians accountable in a useful way. Uh, and I think s s some, yeah, I mean, I, I really like Tom Chivers. I really like, uh, I've thought James Gallagher and Nick Triggle from the BBC have done some very useful things. And I've been quite critical of Nick Triggle in the past, but it, I think he's had a good pandemic in terms of trying to question things. Um, I think the role, I'm sorry to blow your trumpet, Fiona, but the, the Science Media Centre does a useful job in bringing scientists <laughs> and journalists together. Uh, about these things and they talk so that the journalists can kind of they can ask the questions as the bridge between the public and the science and try and m make sense of it for us the public um so i think that that's a, a very very useful task some so that's the bridgehead i think 
and so, so actually journalism is really really important in terms of this in terms of tribalism um the i mean i'm not sure that whether it is much better here it's just on a smaller scale i mean uh, about three or four weeks ago i just sent out a little tweet because people kept saying this thing about the vaccine exper it's experimental mm. um and i just said we've delivered six billion doses of it now i don't think it's experimental anymore <laughs> and i just pile on and i'm sure a lot of the people that were, were from the uk or from ireland or whatever that the um uh, you know, something like, oh, it's only been 10 months or whatever. I know, but that's a lot of doses. I think if there's bad things happening, we've got a pretty good sense of what, what is happening now. Um, and, you know, the, some, of, you know, some of the biggest uh, sort of wrong-headed thinkers on things um, have been from the British Isles. Uh, 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 Ivor Cummings brings to mind as always a, a, as a great uh, touchstone of thus how to completely misinterpret data to um uh to to forward a certain position on the, on the world but there are plenty more like that so we've got it here in this country as well and they have followings um so the only thing i think you can do i mean i won't go back to the point i ended on in my introduction is debate and and in particular obviously we don't physically debate like this all the time but if you're for example on social media follow the people you think you disagree with as well as the people that yeah. um you do agree with or you do trust because you know sometimes there's some useful points made by the, your opposition that mm. will think they're actually they're just right or at least you've got to explain the observation or the point that they're making in your own terms to disagree with them i think that is a very very useful thing to do in general so yes listen to people you just dis generally disagree with because occasionally they're right i mean i don't want everyone to pile on rob but you know <laughs> things have been sped up during this pandemic you know, to get the vaccines out there. Some people think they were sped up too much. Some people not, not fast enough. Corners were cut. People think that. You're more than welcome uh, to say it here and now. Um, and I, I, I hope we discuss preprints as well. Obviously, there's a huge amount of misinformation on social media. You already mentioned Ivor Cummings and there's many other people like that. I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are about censorship by the big tech companies of some of this stuff, of flagging up warnings, and if you do agree with that kind of thing, wh how, where's the bar? You know, where's, where's the threshold at which you start deleting things or banning people or putting warnings on, on certain statements? Hi there, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel for speaking to us today. It's been very interesting listening to you all. Um, I think my comment really is more directed towards Rob Lyons. You've made the point just a moment ago that uh, we've uh, delivered six, mi six billion doses of this, uh, this vaccine. Uh, and it's not experimental anymore. I'd just like to remind the panel that we did have a drug called thalidomide, which was very highly thought of, very widely distributed, and it took four years to draw the connection between thalidomide and the miscarriages and the deformed births that it caused. So what are the panel going to say if we get four years down the line and we suddenly find that this drug is another thalidomide? Okay. And that's, thank you. So just on Stuart's thing, I'm coming straight down with you to buy a book. It sounds fantastic, and mm -hmm. I didn't know about it. Um, but I just think if, obviously, you've just only had five minutes, but if your theory is right, then COVID would have been disastrous. Um, if the way we're doing science is massively lowering the quality of science, mm -hmm. I just think this 18 months would have been a story, of, as, as everybody's talked about, speeded out, preprints, all of this. And I kind of, I mean, I've spent 18 months working on this and I have ranted every day. I have been angry with journalists. I've been angry with scientists. I've been angry with government because in the heat of it, so many things went wrong. But it does feel like in the last month or so that I've had time to kind of sit back and reflect how has this gone. And I actually think it's a really positive chapter in the story of science and the media. Um, and I think if you look at MMR and GM and much more recently antidepressants coverage and e-cigarettes and uh, I can't think of what other statins, for God's sake, mm. food and diet, they're actually not good chapters. They're, they're bad chapters. They've been covered badly. I think people have gone off antidepressants because of misleading information, have not taken up e-cigarettes that could have saved their lives. I just don't see that big problem w with the way, you know, we, we didn't know 
anything about this virus. We knew nothing. We didn't know if people transmitted it to other people. We didn't know about immunity and how long it lasted. Well, we still don't know, actually. Um, we have learned so much through science. The list that Rob gave, you know, the, the variants we found very... It, it feels like it's a much more positive story of science. And yes, we've all got examples. I had one, a, um, a UCL space scientist who decided to do some modelling. Um, and it did get picked up a bit by the media, but actually, you know, the benefit of having these specialist science reporters in the newsroom um, and being deferred to quite often. I think Sean Linton from the, from the Indy said, for the first time ever, I was the most important person <laughs> in my newsroom. And all these political people were asking me. I don't know if Pe Peston was. I suspect he wasn't. But generally, they were. And they do know. A, a bunch of space scientists doing epidemiological yeah. modelling was not one to report. These things went viral on Twitter, but they didn't go viral in the news media. And in fact, one of the stories of this pandemic is thousands of people around the world coming back from social media and Twitter where they had fun, but for their news, their trusted news, they came back to legacy media. So it just feels to me like if your book was right this would have been a disaster because we would have, you know, after all these years of driving down quality of science because of the way we do it, we would have seen it everywhere. And I'm not sure that we did. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'd like to say I think it was a disaster. Um, so two things. First of all, <laughs> going back to your points that you've made, uh, there does seem to be a need to disconnect uh, science from the scientist. Obviously, there mm. are perverse incentives. There are incentives. There are advocacy um, reasons why research is being done. Uh, consequently, if we put them both together, then uh, we are um, we are serving bias that we are not acknowledging. But the, the second point is, and this is the question for the the panel: is what role do you think that scientists have had as decision makers as um, a shield for politicians for any mistakes that are made they can say there is an esoteric um, activity going on mm. we don't know we've got our PPE degrees and our uh, humanity degrees from um, Oxbridge uh, it's the scientists fault um, if the science is so straightforward why did Sweden take a completely different view if it's all about science why did the government over, override the JCBI about vaccinating 12-year-olds. And if it's so straightforward, why were eight of the 20 people on SAGE behavioral scientists? If this disease was so deadly, it would have been obvious and we'd all have been scared to death of it without being frightened by the government. OK, I will, I will come back to the panel. If this book was right, would the last 18 months not have been a disaster? Were the last 18 months, in fact, a disaster? Media, uh, social media censorship, is it justified? And, and by the way, Facebook's been having a bad couple of weeks, but one thing that's emerged over in the States is their sort of VIP list, of people who don't get banned as easily as the likes of us if, if we step out of line. How do we know there's not another thalidomide scandal in, in the making? If there, how would, and if there was one, uh, how would we react? And then coming down to brass tacks, uh, are scientists acting as a shield for the accountability of government or vice versa, depending on the situation? Um, and how do you account for the differing policies in Sweden and the UK uh, uh, and for the disproportionate number of behavioural scientists on stage? Uh, you look eager to jump in, Stuart. Well, I'll, I'll answer the one about my, about my book, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think that I don't really know how to answer that question because I think in some ways... Uh, this pandemic has, uh, as I said at the start, you know, shown all the bad stuff that we do in science and the, the uh, you know, it's accelerated all the bad incentives as we've as we've discussed. But in other ways, um, the science has had more scrutiny than science has ever had. Uh, well, I, I think ever in in the, in the history of any of any research. You know, we've had the entire world suddenly super interested in you know each new development in in in, in COVID, and thus I think the standards in some cases, especially for vaccines. Had to be had to had to be much higher um, than they would than they would otherwise have have been because the, the entire world was looking at it for other things like you know you mentioned nutrition research diets and and statins and all that you know 
there are people interested in it, but it's not as, as much of a pressing, massive concern that we must look at every single table and scrutinize every single number. Um, and, and perhaps that the lesson is that we should be doing that for all the uh, for all science. We should be having specialist science reporters. We should be having um, extreme skepticism of, 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 of each new of each new piece of research. Um, you know, I went to a talk recently by Robert Plowman, who's one of my colleagues at my center, mm -hmm. and he was saying that you know, he's a behavior geneticist, and it's obviously behavior genetics is an extremely controversial area of research. And he feels like because it's so controversial, it's be it, it, it's become a more robust science because the the scientists have to do so much more to to to, to try and convince the, the 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 disbelievers, I guess, or the the, the skeptics of the, of the of the research. And you may have you know your views on behavior genetics may you know may, may vary. Um, but I think um, uh, the 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 science has progressed. Um, Almost in spite of all the problems that I that I discussed, so you know a lot of the a lot of the stuff um, uh, that w that we've learned about, about how science has gone wrong in the past you know ten years or so since the the replication crisis discussion began um, has been put into to to to, to practice. So uh, um, the randomized controlled trials um, of 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 uh, vaccines and another another uh, uh, um, another treatments were pre-registered, you know, for instance. So we had the, the, the analysis plan online and we could very rapidly see whether the scientists were mucking about with the data um, because they had they had shown what they planned to do beforehand. And we could we could say, well, actually, and there were a couple, you know, the AstraZeneca, the initial AstraZeneca trial, they did change a couple of things uh, uh, about the, 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 the procedure that they'd planned to do. And they gave they had to give reasons for it. Now, you know, back in the day or indeed in many other fields of science, you still don't have to pre-register it. You can still muck about with the data. You can still do whatever you want. So I think almost almost because it was a pandemic, we were we were paying much more attention. So, but I think it is a it is a fair point that um you know and, and Rob mentioned this as, as as well. We do have to praise the very um you know the incredible advances that we've, that we've made in science and 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 um it's just that I think there's also this kind of toxic stream of bad stuff happening at the, at the same time, which we need to deal with because it could be so much better. Uh, if if we dealt with all these problems and and you know some fields have it worse than others, it's because of books like yours that it didn't go worse. Yeah, possibly, possibly. Yeah, or at least maybe not books like mine, but the things I discussed in the book, the, the advances that people are making. Yeah. Rob, um, well, so much to talk about. Mm. Um, I mean, Fiona talked about um, space scientists doing modelling. I actually interviewed a physics group, or well, the the head of a physics group at Edinburgh University, who'd been asked by the government to try to replicate the Ferguson team's modeling um, because everybody who actually did health modeling was really busy. So they, they did it and they said basically it was, wasn't was bad. We looked at the, the outcomes compared to what the models had said. They uh, they thought that, that the initial sort of the report nine, as it's called, uh, they got the R number a, a bit low. They lowballed it a bit. There was, should have been about three and but otherwise it kind of worked out pretty well so having a different bunch of modelers doing things as long as they're like they've got the recipe going back to the recipe about then um that there is there is some use in doing that but you know it, just freelancing is probably not particularly useful um in terms i mean the start of this pandemic you you could say that was characterized by both too much PPE in government and not enough PPE in hospitals. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <laughs> <Zing. laughs> um, but, yeah, but at the same time, politicians are elected to make political and decisions based on moral judgments. They're not, uh, so they do have to rely on advisors mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways. And, and whether that process is a, is a good process or not is, you know, is the, the subject of much amongst angst-ridden commentary whatever but that that is the, the nature of it politicians are not experts about housing or necessarily or about the construction industry or anything else so we can't you know we can't assume that the, the people that we elect are going to have all the different skills that re require there, there has to be a way of like like synthesizing information in a way that they can make judgments on our behalf um I mean, JCVI, I mean, JCVI in relation to childhood vac vaccination, I'm very agnostic about it, actually, I have to say. Um, I can see both sides of the story. JCVI said, look, there's just, there's just not the clarity of benefit for 12 to 15 year olds that we can say, yes, you definitely should be doing this. And, it, um, and so they, the, the government took in a broader picture of like school closures or like uh, uh, um, kids missing school or whatever and decided it was worth doing it. Um, that's I, I still don't have a clear opinion about that. Um, 
but I can see yeah, I can see both sides of the story on that one. Uh, so, scientists as a shield, yeah, I suppose that's a little bit like the sort of policy-based evidence thing I was talking about earlier. Mm. So there is a there is a there there is a sense in which, right, um, Chris and Jonathan, could you just go out and say this actually and say that that's a good idea? Uh, uh, there is a feeling that maybe that, that, that there's a little bit of that. I mean, like Jenny Harris going out and saying, yeah, no, definitely masks are a terrible idea. Mm-hmm. Was that motivated in any way by the government not actually having enough masks for everybody? You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know about that. But there, there, it's, it's obviously that the, these are sort of professional pressures that, um, that scientists working in government do have to face. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you. Um, so it's a quick neuroscience thought, which loops back into this. So one of the things that people get wrong about brain science <laughs> is that you can do it using only brain scientists. <laughs> And the reason why you can't do brain science only using brain scientists is that the human brain models everything, including itself. One of the things it models is culture and other people. So therefore, if you want to explain the human brain, you also need to have a bit of an understanding of culture because that's what the brain is modeling. Mm-hmm. Right? So bits of uh, neuroscience that try to do it without engaging with, let's say, the humanities are never going to get there. And it's the modeling piece uh, and, and the reason why you need behavioral scientists and, and the reason why it's hard, it's not simple, is a little bit similar. The best analogy I have for that this week, if I make a weather forecast which predicts how much rain there's going to be in different postcodes in the country at different times, uh, spreading that model isn't going to change its accuracy. If I make a model that predicts where petrol is going to be distributed across the country and uh, circulate that model, it's going to make a big difference <laughs> to where the petrol is, right? Because people are going to follow the model, uh, go for the petrol, there won't be any there. Does that make sense? So when you've got a situation where your model has a feedback loop that is refracted through society and through culture, Mm. rather as the neuroscience, you can't just solve it with maths. And it will depend on the difference between the UK and the US in terms of how people, or indeed the Soviet Union or China, in terms of how people respond to predictions like that. So we have to engage with behavioral scientists. We have to engage with psychology. And we know that, you know, catastrophe averted, right? I predict something bad's gonna happen unless you do something. You do that thing that I told you to do and the bad thing doesn't happen people automatically assume that the prediction initially was wrong. That's just basic psychology. So there are these basic facts that you need uh, in order to get around this. Now, I do think that what people should be doing more of, and when Max over there and I used to do the podcast with The Guardian, we never used new science at all because most of it was wrong, like I said before. You know, if you want to know what the best thing to have done to prepare for the pandemic, it would have been to implement, was it Operation Alice, Project Alice? They did that simulation two Um. years before about mm. what would happen if it was a different, if it was MERS. And they said, well, what you need is a lot of PPE and you need surveillance and you need contact tracing. If they'd simply implemented the thing that was mm. determined by the Department of Health and funded it, we'd have been a lot better off. And the good stuff that happened, the UK did lead because of studies like ICNARC, which is an international study which tracks intensive care admissions from viral illness internationally with a recognized methodology. You can't set that up overnight. The fact that it was set up and funded meant that things like the recovery trial and the, the tracking of these different drugs was possible. So it's, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. Doing the basic things that people, and it is a bit like getting enough sleep and eating vegetables. Mm. I mean, talking of science engagement, I think Hannah Fry's pandemic exercise was a bit underrated, actually, the one she did a couple of years before the yep. pandemic. And then when she did an interview about it early in the pandemic on, on the Number File podcast, uh, she was um, admirably clear, you know, uh, if we don't do anything about this pandemic, people will die. If we implement lockdown or take these other measures, people will die as a consequence of those measures. These are the two things we are weighing up. Ad- admirably clear. I wish others had been <laughs> similarly clear. Ganesh, uh, social media. Yeah, the role of social media in this. I mean, yeah, I think, <laughs> what can I say? You know, if you wanted to go out there, I mean, as an academic scientist, right, in the last five years especially, um, there's been a huge drive for all of us to get out there and be on Twitter and be accessible, let's put it that way. And in fact, there's a whole little realm of academic Twitter, as I already alluded to with the memes and whatnot, where academics communicate with each other across you know, different countries and it's all great and wonderful, fine. But Twitter is an open space, so if any of you wanted to follow any scientists, whether they were PhD students, you know, um, or group leaders, or Nobel Prize, or whatever. Actually, the older boys don't tend to be on Twitter, but that's a separate problem. Um, so, you know, you can do that, but what does that really help? Like, how does that help, really, in the context of a pandemic? I don't, I don't think it really does. And I think this, this sort of something that's coming through to me, at least, Sue, having this conversation is, 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but is it actually fair to ask people who are doing science or who's supposed to be, you know, getting in, you know, getting up to their elbows and doing this thing and keeping clear of it to also be responsible exclusively for getting everybody in the public to understand that? And I think the answer to that is absolutely no, right? Your job is to do your job well enough for your peers to be able to say, yep, that seems pretty sound. I do think is publicly funded that, you know, and that is part of the reason why I'm here, for example, and I hold that to be a belief rather than anything else, that because I am publicly funded, if I'm asked to come and, you know, be a scientist in public, I will do so because I am effectively paid for by you lot. Thank you. Um, but also that we have actual like methods, like structures in place to digest that huge volume of information that's generated. And I think that's actually where Max's point is very well received and, and you know, Fiona's work in the Science Media Center. That's, the, that's kind of, I think actually the role of journalists or somebody else or some expert of, of sort of communicating this kind of thing, not actually the scientists, I think. And, you know, I understand that in this pandemic context, um, I'll, I'll give you an anecdote of this. I genuinely ended up in a situation doing public engagement outside the research institute that I work in. And one of the, the ladies who was there said, you know, I didn't want to see those two old men standing there. I wanted to see all of the scientists. I wanted to see them all standing there telling me, yes, this is what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. And I and I thought that's really a, interesting, right? Like, what, what, what are we going to do? Have those PowerPoint presentations, but only every single postdoc in London's there going, <laughs> yeah, really? Oh, where's your scale bar on that, by the way? Um, but actually, it, 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 yeah, it, it also talks to that like idea of it's it's about trust. It's about who do you trust to do this and why, and and why is it that you know? On one hand, we trust scientists. On the other hand, we don't trust scientists. Or do we trust science? Do we not trust science? And you know, I'm biased. Obviously, I think good science rises to the top and it's good science that was done in the decades leading up to this moment that meant that we understood things about hygiene and whatnot and that's why we ended up doing as well as we did but yeah scientists are different to science and how we define that trust and how we build those relationships is is i think increasingly going to need to be mediated by other people who maybe as as daniel said actually understand something about human psychology a lot more right because if they'd have got up and said Frankly, this is new. We don't really know what's going on. Um, we don't have any data on this. And without data, modeling is pretty rough going. Can't have a great deal of statistical significance. So we're going to have to have our best bet at this and just bear with us as we go. I might find that reassuring because that's the kind of language I'm used to. But I think I'd need a psychologist of some description to tell me whether or not that would cause mass panic and hysteria or not. You sound very like Boris Johnson in your very form of words just now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, a, a, thoughts from the audience, please. Um, so you, you didn't address this guy's um, question, which may be tired. You may have heard it like a bunch of times before, but I am really, really curious to hear your response. Um, Which one? The thalidomide. The thalidomide. Oh, right. I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. given that yeah, you yeah. you have given, I mean, a slightly experimental uh, therapy to millions and millions of people, and there are many assurances that everything will be fine. I mean, are you absolutely sure of that, or is it, it just no. you can't? It's just the best thing that you could do at the time. Do you think there would be more better to sort of acknowledge that it might mm -hmm. uh, that make people feel yeah. a little yeah. bit uh, less? Yeah. You know. Hey, look, I, uh, I don't want to be I don't want to be disrespectful, but I think there's a kind of disingenuous pseudo naivety <laughs> in the way that those questions are asked, as if the people making the decisions <laughs> to deploy these vaccines haven't thought of the possibility. I mean, the people who are doing this have spent their lives developing, deploying and evaluating vaccines. And so it's not it's not that I'm against public debate and I'm not against scrutiny and I'm not against people suggesting things. But I just the, the bit where people say, well, hasn't it occurred to the people doing this that maybe this is going to have an effect in three years time? And so we need to wait three years to know whether it's had that effect before we roll it out. Like it's it's an obviously good question, but it's not as if it hasn't occurred to the people doing it. And it's also not as if they wouldn't lament the consequences of it but that in their judgment based on in this case years of data 
in a domain of deploying potentially harmful drugs to children globally, they've made that call. So you can have an argument about the detail of it, but the bit where people go, well, haven't they thought that maybe there's a consequence feels to me almost like a disingenuous well, question, but maybe I'm being a bit unfair in asking. Well, that, I agree with all of that, Daniel, but the problem is if you say the sort of thing you just said on YouTube, you will get banned. Yeah. And Sorry. I'd be interested what, to hear what people think about I that. Mean, <coughs> what, 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 what I said was that I thought the question was disingenuous. Will I get banned for saying that? Um, I know lots of people who've had very adverse reactions to the vaccine, and lots of people have got cancer now, and some are terminal. And I only know one person who died of COVID, and he had a heart bypass. And all the censorship and everything else really, you know, it makes me very uncomfortable and worried and concerned why lots of things haven't been banned on the internet for ages and suddenly you know we can't discuss anything and lots of very bland sites have just been banned and lots of people you know having their twitter switched off so i really don't like that aspect but um so but you know i'd, I'd like to say also that a lot of people who had the vaccine have got covid now covid was circulating in london um in 2019 because i People had the same symptoms, and most of them got over it. Some people seemed to have a bit of a long-term thing. And then it was discovered at the beginning of last year. So I'm not sure. I mean, there's money behind it. We know whenever something um, is happening, it's usually money or power. Okay. Yeah? So, I mean, there's lots of companies which have got a lot of money which they're making at the moment. And some people in government have got shares in those companies. So, of course, you know, while the government itself, another point I want to make is... Quickly, you know, please. it's in their interest to do something. They wanted to show Boris wanted to show he is doing something, and so he grasped onto the vaccines or something. Now, whether they work or they don't work, I don't know. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait the four years to sort of see what happens because I'm a little bit cautious from what I've okay. seen has happened around me. I just wanted to say, are the public demanding to be told everything is safe? Is it something that we and I don't mean me personally, but we have asked for. We want everything to be assured and we want it all to be fine. So we're being given the assurances because we're asking for them. Okay. Is there a problem when scientists are talking to people who don't have their level of expertise? Um, for instance, uh, let's say you're building a, a nuclear power station and you might do the, do, do these sums and say, oh, it'll kill you know, 10 to 20 people. And if you say that, people jump up and down. As the thing with COVID, you 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 do the you do the calculations. People take jabs. There's there's always some people get a side effect. So you might kill a thousand people. You might save hundred thousand lives or whatever. Well, guess what? The thousand gets all gets all gets all things. And and it's difficult. That said, I know I have read um, uh, um, uh, academic papers, not actually to do do with science, but uh, there's a chi squared test. Now, 20 years ago, I might have known about it. Perfectly honest with you, do I understand it? I wait for someone to get, to do the conclusion. What actually happens is I look at various things and when people say something if I there's three something I do know about and I know it might not be true that's how I, that's how I do the test if I know nothing about the subject how how, 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 how how do I know I can only really see do I do I trust people thank you very much again um, I'd like to say my question about thalidomide was obviously <laughs> disingenuous of course you've considered the possibility that this might be thalidomide but the thing is when I raise the question, it gets dismissed. You don't acknowledge the possibility that this might be thalidomide. Uh, what we want is an acknowledgement that there are risks in this, that it's not 100% guaranteed to be safe, and there are risks on both sides. And that's really where I'm, I'm angry, because when I try to raise my mm. concern, I get dismissed. Mm. Now, that makes sense. OK, I'm going to bring the panel back in the same order in which they gave their introductions, both to <coughs> respond to whatever they want from what's been said and to offer a concluding thought. Now, things that need to, nettles that need to be grasped include the thalidomide question, mm. include the getting banned from YouTube, Facebook, what have you question, mm. and include the feeling talked down to mm. question, which, in, which relates to the behavioural science issue, because, you know, none of us like, I, don't, I suspect, Certainly, I don't like being thought of as part of a model that someone else is studying and having someone talk to me accordingly. It somehow makes me feel like someone's talking down to me, whether that's true or not. Um, so these are all things to take on board. If you could reflect on those and also uh, uh, give your concluding thoughts for the day in the same order in which we started. So please, go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, 
Um, uh, well, it's a, a, a few different things, I suppose. Um, I think we should grasp the nettle of the thalidomide question. I wrote an article uh, also for Unheard way before we had the vaccines um, when uh, we were sort of preparing for the wave of vaccine skepticism, vaccine skepticism that there might be. And, uh, and, I, and I, I, I said we should bear in mind that there have been some vaccines that have had unexpected bad effects in the past. The flu vaccine in the 1970s in America had to be had to be pulled because of bad uh, uh, reactions that people didn't expect. Um, there have been various others. And, and you know, there are rare cases where people do get injured by vaccines and, and, and so on. But the point that I think people miss when they're, when they're you know, being skeptical about vaccines, being, um, you know, bringing up things like thalidomide is the background of the situation that we're in was a pandemic. Like the background of the situation we're in was that, that, that hundreds of thousands of people were at risk of, of getting this disease and, 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 and you know, and and potentially dying, especially if they were if they were elderly, um, of of this really bad disease. And I think so much of the the commentary about COVID, whether it's about the vaccine effects, whether it's about the freedom, the effects on freedom of you know lockdowns and and, and so on, it, it's almost it's almost a bizarre sort of um, a surreal situation you get into because the people asking the questions never concede that yes, okay, there was a pandemic happening. And I think possibly some of that is because of, you know, the sort of uh, uh, people who don't believe that COVID was dangerous at all in the first place, which obviously is, 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 is an incorrect view. But, um, but, uh, but, but I think, you know, to have a kind of more sophisticated view, we can't just, we can't just say, well, it's nothing like thalidomide, shut up, we're not gonna, we're not gonna answer that question. Um, the re we have to give reasons, and I think people do give reasons. So, you know, um, we've got lots of evidence from previous vaccines about when long-term effects happen. And long term when we talk about long-term vaccine effects, it tends to be things which occur very, very quickly after the vaccine, but they but they they last a long time. So there are there are very rare cases of that. But um, I don't think there's there's any previous evidence of things appearing further down the line, you know, years and years and years down the line that are that are adverse effects, for instance. So that would be like a prior that we should put into our Bayesian calculus about the the, de the damages of the vaccines. Anyway, and I just wanted to also say that I, I think I think cracking down on social media and saying that people can't say things is a terrible idea. Yeah. And in fact, feeds it, it feeds into yes. uh, uh, conspiracy theories and and general alienation from mainstream scientific thought. And I think it's a, it's an awful idea. And I hate the idea of, of, of saying something and having it censored by some social media uh, uh, um, intern uh, who's who's uh, who's going through all the YouTube videos and saying you can't say that you can't say that terrible idea um, and, and I think just makes the problem worse. Has anyone seen a thing on a on a uh, you know a little um, you know they had a little thing appended oh, to yeah. a tweet saying this has been some information um, and, and 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 really changed their mind? I, I suspect I suspect not. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna Let's clap at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, Even though I agree, I I also agree. Though I'm gonna leave the the censorship point to the to the psychologist, um, basically in this context. I'm also now going to speak very much as a human being, um, very candidly as an individual, um, and I'm gonna talk to the vaccine hesitancy crowd because this is what I have been doing throughout the entire pandemic as a human being. Um, I think it's really important to say, I understand, we understand, right? It's totally okay to be worried and scared about something like this. Um, as Stuart said, we were in the context of a pandemic. That's a big, scary word. Everyone's piling on televisions. Every form of media we're looking at is telling us people are dying. This is right, this is wrong. You should do this, put this in your body. Don't put this in your body, do this with your body. That's a high, highly stressful situation. And I'm going to confess that when I first started reading up on the vaccines, I thought about it quite a lot. I thought, wow, you know, we haven't really had four years worth of people who are willing to get tested with this vaccine, injected and then exposed to COVID just casually in the lab, right? For someone to give me a stat on what the likelihood of this thing having any effect or efficacy is, right? We don't have that luxury and how on earth do we pick those people to begin with, right? And then ultimately when I was offered the opportunity to get vaccinated early because we were involved in the vaccination program itself. So I was asked if I would be willing to vaccinate others. I sat down and I did a little chart, known knowns, known unknowns, risks, costs, benefits, all this kind of thing. I have a whiteboard in my living room because I'm a nerd like that. Mm. And I really sat down and I thought about it and I got quite anxious, right? And so because I did all of that, I maintain the fact that it's okay for people to think I'm not sure. I think that's totally fine. You're entitled to do that. You are meant to make your decision as you do. I made my decision 
despite the fact I'd had many conversations with many scientists who privately were also saying, gosh, you know, listen, mRNA vaccines, you know, they've only been tested in the context of cancer patients. But, you know, hey-ho, they, they've done the tests or whatever. You know, even in the scientific community, we have faith in other scientists doing their jobs right. And for me, this is just the one thing I'm sharing now as a human being. I made my decision to take the vaccine even though no one can tell me for sure, because there is no certainty in this context, that I will be fine next year, in five years time, 10 years time. But then again, no one can tell me for sure that if I'd caught COVID, I'd be fine in that time either. And for me, the ultimate trump card came when I realized that I was sat there washing my hands, putting hand cream on my hands, putting nail varnish on my hands, eating out of a plastic Tupperware pot, God knows what else, right? And I suddenly had this moment where I thought, I'm not sure I know the long-term effects of pretty much anything that I've touched today. So why is it that suddenly I'm obsessing about this? And I've been, when I went to Vietnam, I got vaccinated for malaria. Did I once question that? No. Last Christmas before the pandemic, when I got vaccinated for the flu, I started reading the leaflet and I thought, geez, I don't want to know this. And I put it away. I said, just put it in my arm. I'll be fine. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, in February of 2020, right before, as the pandemic was happening, I caught the flu and got hospitalized by the flu despite having been vaccinated. So at that point I thought, you know what? This is the best that human knowledge can offer me and I'm gonna take part in this because I'm in here with everyone else and I'll be one of those stats. That's right. what I'm gonna leave you with. Daniel, uh, silence applause for that. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, I. I, I definitely am not against YouTube and I'm not in favor of banning things. I'm kind of against the YouTube sidebar, but that's something to talk about <laughs> afterwards, right? Like, I think if, any, if people switched off the YouTube sidebar, that would be fine by me. But the <laughs> YouTube itself, don't think should be switched off. Um, I do, here's somebody I didn't enjoy listening to, John Prescott. There was, um, there was a, 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 a crash on the railway and Prescott was the transport minister and he stood up and said, no amount of money is too much to spend to save a life on the railway, right? <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's ridiculous. And I think that statements like that have to be seen to be ridiculous. It has to be politically unacceptable to say things like that. If he'd spoken to his own people in the ministry, they can tell him exactly how much money they're prepared to spend to save a life on the railway. It's 150 uh, million pounds and they'll do that. And if, you know, they won't spend a billion, but they will spend 100 million. And that's, it's quantified. We should be in favor of quantification. And I guess for me, where I end up with all of this is back to the how science works, not even how the science really works. People are using phrases like PCR and lateral flow uh, as household terms, people are using uh, risk ratios. The Spiegelhalter piece I thought was super interesting. You have as much risk of dying from COVID this year as you had from dying at all this year as an additional risk. That was super helpful. I'm planning to use this extraordinary engagement with <coughs> science that's frightening us all and, and taking such a role in our lives to get some basic principles across. And if you can understand how PCR works and how it amplifies and the difference between that and lateral flow, Firstly, you'll be better able to assess the evidence that you're being uh, given within the communication from the government channels, but also you'll have learned a bit of science, and that's not a bad thing in itself. So that's, my, that's where I'm taking all of this. Okay, and finally, Rob. Um, sorry, I just for, forgot your question. I did, I did mean to respond to it. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, say, uh, how do we know, I think the, the two things that, um, um, that reassure me about... Um, whether this is the lid of mine or not, is first of all that the world is watching and then people are ready to jump on anything about this at the moment. So I think that uh, that's that's just very useful that, that people are paying attention. And secondly, thalidomide. Uh, the fact that we've had that before, we've had mm. the lessons of thalidomide uh, uh, is very, very useful in terms of you know testing things um, and you know uh, and the limitations of testing and all that sort of stuff as well. But I mean, the fact it wouldn't have taken four years um, with thalidomide, if everybody had been paying attention to thalidomide, um, I mean, I, I uh, last year I did a, a, an article uh, about um, the swine flu vaccine. There was there was a there was a, a problem with the swine flu vaccine in two thousand and nine, but one of them uh, where um, some people suffered from narcolepsy as a result of it. And I I talked to the um, the the head of the the narcolepsy charity that you know represents people. With, with this, the, fir the first thing that I would say, conclusion I had from that was that the um, there isn't enough support for people, financial support for people who've ha who have had been affected by vaccinations. The, the current system is absolutely pathetic, really. It's like there's one 
uh, sort of award a year or something like that, and it's about a hundred grand limit on it. So I think that uh, in that article I said that it needs to be brought up to date, and there has to be a, a much faster system for dealing with all that. Secondly, the guy from Narcolepsy UK didn't get narcolepsy from the vaccine; he got it from swine flu. Mm. So th- that is always the trade-off: is that whatever the vaccine might do to you chances are the virus itself will probably is more likely to do it to you so um th- that's one of the things that fa- factors for me as, as well in terms of um uh, of taking the vaccines it, it i think it will protect me against uh, give me a better chance if i do uh exp- you know become into contact with the, the with the virus um on the the youtube banning thing i'll end here um just i mean the, if you think you've got weeds there's two ways you could deal with it you could try try weed killer and try to sort of deal with the individual weeds, or you could just concrete over your garden. And I think just censorship <laughs> is like concreting over the garden. Um, and I think that public debate and challenging people on their ideas when they make uh, misleading or false claims about, for example, vaccines or COVID or whatever it is, is a better way forward for dealing with these things than censorship is or health warnings are and all that sort of stuff. So I would very much prefer that sort of approach and I think that's much more in spirit with what we're trying to do here as well. Right. Well let's thank our speakers.